Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to this installment of Orthodoxy in Islam, a webinar series that is one of the many initiatives of the Orthodox Studies Center at Fordham University. The Fordham Center facilitates, funds, and publishes scholarship on the Orthodox Christian world broadly understood. To learn more about the center, its initiatives, or publications, please visit their website at www.fordham.edu slash orthodoxy. We would also encourage you to follow us on YouTube and to share this and other videos with anyone who might benefit from them. And please don't forget to like our current content online so that others can find it more easily. So today's webinar is entitled Islam in the Russian World. It will focus in particular on the political relationship between Islam and Orthodoxy in Russia. And we'll focus on how the Russian world, the Ruski Mir ideology deployed by Vladimir Putin and Patriarch Kirill of Moscow has been utilized by Russian state approved Muslim leaders in recent years as the second largest religious community in the Russian Federation after Orthodox Christians and members of indigenous ethnic minorities in territories conquered by the Russian empire. The experiences of ethnic Muslims in contemporary Russia are key to understanding Russian imperialism in the past and the present. Our discussion will uncover important new ways of thinking about the history, ideology, and geopolitics of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the alarming renewal of the Russian imperial project. I want to also encourage you to put your questions in the chat for our Q&A session that will follow our two presenters. First, I want to introduce you to Dr. Gulnaz Sugatulina, a postdoctoral fellow at Amsterdam School for Regional, Transnational, and European Studies at the University of Amsterdam and the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University. Her research interests focus on the history and presence of Islam in Europe, sociology of religion and religious language, and post-colonial translation studies. Her ongoing research project funded by Marie Skłodowska Curie Action Fellowship brings into the spotlight a broad international network of European converts to Islam. In 2019 to 2021, Dr. Sibgatulina was a member of the European Research Council. The project, the European Quran, Islamic Scripture in European Culture and Religion, the Synergy Team. In 2014 to 19, she worked on her doctoral thesis as part of the research group, The Russian Language of Islam, led by Professor Michael Kemper and Professors Joseph Shakin and funded by the Dutch Research Council. Dr. Sibgatulina has also been a visiting scholar at the Goethe University in Germany, University of Edinburgh in the UK, and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign here in the United States, and has held the position of lecturer and researcher in the Department of Russian and Eurasian Studies at Leiden University of the Netherlands. Dr. Peter Mandeville is Professor of International Affairs at the Shar School of Policy and Government and Director of the Ali Vural Ak Center for Global Islamic Studies, both at George Mason University. He is also a senior research fellow at Georgetown University's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, and a senior visiting expert at the United States Institute of Peace. From 2011 to 12, he served in government at the U.S. State Department as a member of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's policy planning staff, and then again from 2015 to 2016 as a senior advisor in the Secretary of State's Office of Religious, Religious, uh, Religion and Global Affairs, where he helped to build the capacity of American diplomats to engage with religious actors to advance U.S. foreign policy and national security objectives. His previous affiliations include the Center for Strategic International Studies and the Pew Research Center. He's the author of a number of very important books. Um, I want to draw your attention to Wahhabism in the World, Understanding Saudi Arabia's Global Influence on Islam, recently published, and the forthcoming Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power, How States Use Religion and Foreign Policy. He's published numerous journal articles, book chapters, and op-ed commentary pieces in outlets such as Foreign Affairs, International Herald Tribune, The Guardian, The Atlantic, Online, and Foreign Policy. He's also testified multiple times before the U.S. Congress on topics including political Islam, U.S. counterterrorism policy, and human rights in the Middle East. His research has been supported by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Social Science Research Council, the British Council, and the Henry Luce Foundation. And I'm Phil Dorrell, Associate Professor of Religion here at Walford College in South Carolina, where my research focuses on Islamic theology and contemporary Turkish and classical Arabic and Eastern Christian theology and Arabic and the interaction of Muslims and Orthodox Christians. So thank you again, everyone, for coming. And I'll turn the floor over to Gulnaz to begin our conversation. Thank you so much, Philip, uh, for indeed for inviting me to, to be part of this panel. And thank you for Fordham University to hosting us. 
And indeed, the topic is, of course, very important um, against the current developments in the Eastern Europe. And before we go into the particularities of how uh, Muslim either leaders or communities participate in the ongoing war, I would like to provide some background about the history of relationship between the Russian state, Russian Orthodox Church, and what we call muftiates or spiritual organizations that represent um, Muslim communities on an official level. So um, in the conversation with the state. An important point probably for our discussion is to realize that the very Institute of Muftiates in itself is an artificial creation. Uh, it has been first established in the Russian empire at the end uh, of the 18th century in 1789, by the Russian state that was trying to indeed establish new institutions to govern growing Muslim communities um, in the Russian Empire. The very institution of the Muftiates was created um, following the blueprint of the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, so there is indeed Muslim clergy, there are representations uh, in particular communities that are all responsible or um, reporting to the states about the communities, their numbers. They're also responsible for making sure that Islamic law is in compliance with the Russian state law. And at the same time, doing this um, general function such as registering births, registering marriages, um, and indeed providing this an overview of the communities. This institution is also survived through the Soviet Union. And given the, the sheer space of the Soviet Union, we had four uh, muftis, one in Central Asia, one for Central and Siberian Russia, and two in the Caucasus, one for Sunni Muslims and one for Shia Muslims. Although in the post-Soviet space, in the post-Soviet time in the 90s, uh, of course, we do see that the whole functions or existing structures that negotiated or made sure that there was a communication between the state and religious institution collapsed together with the Soviet uh, state itself. Therefore, in the 90s, instead of the four uh, major muftiates, we see the growth of those splinter organizations up till 60 or even more organization that emerged in the post-Soviet space. So you have to imagine if before there was at least four leaders that were responsible for different regions, now they become 60. And of course they start competing with each other for authority, for the representation, for financial institutions and for financial flows, which is again, very different process that the Russian Orthodox Church was going through. So what we do have by the time that Vladimir Putin's come to power is that the Russian Orthodox Church um, is already has amassed certain uh, amount of property. There is established relationship with the state because indeed Russian Orthodox Church remained as a more or less hierarchical institution. Although you do have competing groups within it, but still the patriarch is the one who is responsible and representative for the entire institution. Whereas the Muftiates by then uh, lost their financial flows since Russia decided to take control over the influences that came that come with money from foreign countries. So the Russian state become the sole sponsor of all those institutions. This means mosque buildings, supporting the muftiates themselves, their everyday organization. So the muftiates became a politically dependent on from the state because the state was either closing those who didn't agree with the, uh, certain rules and regulations and at the same time also financially dependent since all the flows financial flows were going through the state so we do have by the time indeed putin came to power is that triangle uh, it's the state russian orthodox church and the muftiates so there is no single muftiate that represented all muslims in russia but rather a combination of several muftiates that were a bit more powerful than the other splinter organizations and there we do have two we have one in moscow led by um ravil gainuddin and one in ufa uh, led by talgat tajuddin so those two are representative for uh, central and European part of Russia. And then we have the Caucasus in itself, which is again a very different Muslim community represented with its own uh, smaller muftiates. But by 2020, I would say the sole leader or the speaker on behalf of Muslims in the Caucasus is Ramzan Kadyrov, who is political leader of Chechnya. So he's not an appointed mufti as, for example, Tajuddin or Gainuddin that I was talking before, but he's a political leader because he's a leader of Chechnya. But at the same time, and I think we will talk about it today, he's indeed the spokesperson for Muslim communities in the Caucasus. So what you do see that 
in the Russian Orthodox Church has uh, initiated rapprochement with the state. Um, and there's a lot of research has been published about it, how indeed starting from 2000 and even slightly earlier, uh, Russian Orthodox Church participates in decision making, it or, uh, operates as a um, legitimization organ for sort of political decisions or even as a symbolic support for the Russian state, the president, um, and as well as inside Russia, but also outside of Russia. Whereas Muftiates um, at that point are indeed limited in their ideological maneuvering, because here with Russia, again, we have to keep in mind that the securitization of Islam, namely seeing Muslims, Muslim communities and Islam as a religion, as a threat to the stability of society started already in the 90s. So if for the global world, we can point 9-11 as the time in it where the discourse changes drastically, in Russia, this has been the case already in the 90s. So by the 2000s, the Muftis are very much limited in ideological um, project making. They simply have to, most of the time, support uh, whatever course the Russian state takes. And as a result, there is a pressure both from within the Muftis, but also from the outside, to comply with the rules of the game. And essentially to repeat and copy whatever Russian Orthodox Church is doing, and for that receives the financial support from the state. So the Mufti is pra practically copying the same strategies. And this we see in the language that is used, the, the rhetoric, because it's also the period when we start hearing more um, pronounced the whole discourse of traditional values, Russia presenting itself as a defender of traditional values in the world, as opposition to the pernicious, imagined, homogenous uh, West. And Mufti has very much support the same rhetoric saying that indeed if Orthodox Church operates as a norm defender in for the majority society, the Muftiates and Islam as they, they represent serves the same functions within the Muslim communities. It's also happened that this, the, the copying, uh, as I call it, uh, found itself also on the level of symbols. So we do see that experimenting in 2000s where, for example, one of the Muftis, uh, Talgat Tajuddin, began calling himself the Mufti of the whole Russia, as patriarch of the whole Russia, of Rusi. So he was trying to adopt the same title just to claim similar authority. Uh, or the use of holy water, we also do see that there is also even copying of certain elements and rituals to approximate Islam and Christianity to show that there is not so much difference and that Islam is in itself a peaceful religion and is compatible with Russian values and norms. But what I was personally focusing on during my PhD research was exactly the language that uh, Muftiates and the leaders of those institutions were using. Namely, we do see the transition or even abandonment of Arabic loan words, which are of course the, the core of Islamic vocabulary simply because certain notions are not as easily translatable into other languages. So the, the leaders of those Muftiates were trying to uh, replace Arabic vocabulary, which for the Russian ear still sounds as a foreign uh, or something that is, should be uh, indeed feared about, by vocabulary from the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. With certain ideas, there may be a discussion to what extent they are indeed replaceable. For example, can we call Allah as a god? In Russian will be Boh. And there may be indeed a theological discussion to what extent God in Islam is the same as in Orthodox Christianity. But some examples went too far that even communities themselves rebelled. For instance, there was a case with the word Maulit, which is the birthday of Prophet Muhammad. And uh, one of the Muftis in Moscow suggested that instead we use the word uh, Christmas, which is very similar to indeed what will be uh, in English the word Christmas, namely the birthday of the Christ. And in Russian will be Rajdistvo, which is again very loaded term, indeed reserved for very particular celebrations um, in the Orthodox Christian tradition. They indeed there is always going on this experimenting, but sometimes indeed it works through, sometimes it receives a backlash. But we do see a tendency, a tendency to approximate Islam to Christianity, not only in its functions that they fulfilled in. Uh, Russian society today, but also simply on the level of theology, ideas, and norms and values. Um, and probably indeed for what will be another point important for our discussion that I mentioned that Orthodox 
church functions more or less as a coherent institution, whereas in Islam we do have competing uh, muftiates. And also probably important then, it's simply by fact it's practically impossible to create an institution that will receive legitimacy throughout Muslim communities in Russia simply because those communities have very different a um, historical backgrounds. Um, they have been integrated in the Russian Empire at different points. They have very different trajectories of development and relationship with Russia itself. B, there are also serious differences in simply uh, in practice and understanding of Islam. So there's on rituals and uh, indeed the sources that are used, there is a serious differentiation that permits uh, this unification under um, one umbrella uh, organization. And third, muftis in themselves are currently seen as an extension of the state. Therefore, to within the communities, they have different degrees of authority, but more or less we can say that uh, they are not so much as spiritual leaders or spiritual authorities, but rather institutional authorities that indeed can make sure that certain needs of the communities are met, but they barely seen as spiritual authorities. And that of course also creates certain tension. I will stop at uh, this point, And I think there will be indeed other points of discussion as we move uh, forward in the present day situation. Thank you very much. That's, that, that does give us a lot to think about and talk about that we will come back to for sure. Thank you. Peter, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much, Phil, and, and greetings to everyone joining us today. Um, so I, I wanna say at the outset that this presentation is a little bit unusual for me and a bit outside my comfort zone because I'm not by any means a Russia expert or an expert on Russian um, foreign policy. Um, I, I have, however, spent much of my academic career studying the intersection of Islam and international relations. Um, and courtesy of a project that I've been leading at Georgetown University's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs over the last few years. This is the Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power Project, uh, kindly supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, whose purpose is to look comparatively at the various ways that uh, governments incorporate religion and religious outreach into their foreign policy, um, this has given me a certain vantage point uh, from which to observe um, some of the ways that um, Islam has featured in Russia's external relations in recent years. So in that sense, I'll be hoping to provide something of an external uh, counterpoint to um, the, the very rich uh, presentation that Gulnad's just offered um, on some of the internal dynamics. So I think by now it's fair to say that the close partnership that the Kremlin has developed with the Russian Orthodox Church and particularly Patriarch Kirill is fairly well documented and established. Um, we hear quite a lot about it. And, and indeed my, my Georgetown project has looked at it um, uh, in, in various ways. We tend to hear less or see less focus on the question of Islam in Russian foreign policy, which is my focus today. And just to telegraph up front the basic argument that I wanna make, um, it is to say that despite assumptions that a Russian populist nationalism would emphasize Orthodox Christianity as a defining characteristic, and, and it does in many respects, Putin's discourse of a Russian world has actually left considerably more space for Islam and for strategic deployment of Islam in the Kremlin's external relations than is often appreciated. I think that in order to understand this, you have to understand also something of the evolving positionality of Islam in Russia's external relations um, from the end of the Cold War. Um, you know, when, when the Cold War ends uh, and, and the R Russia um, emerges as the kind of primary regional power broker, um, I think it's fair to say that there was some leftover baggage from the late Cold War experience that had an enormous impact on um, how early post-Cold War Russian foreign policy thought about and treated Islam. Um, there was certainly concern about potential encroachment by countries in the Middle East on Russia's Muslim provinces and populations. Uh, there was, of course, in the early 1990s, uh, the, the, uh, the, the war in, 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 in Chechnya, and I think particularly concern that uh, Chechen rebel groups uh, 
may begin to forge strategic relationships with countries in the Middle East. And of course, there was some degree of transnationalism uh, and financing and support that, that happened there. I think there was also kind of an important memory of the experience of uh, uh, Afghanistan um, and the idea that broadly speaking, um, Islam and Muslim political forces were not likely to be well aligned with the interests of Russia. And here I think there's an interesting comment to make about how um, early post-Cold War Russian attitudes, attitudes towards Islam represent to some extent and to some extent counterintuitively, I think, the flip side of um, the ways in which Islam featured in uh, US foreign policy. Again, I think particularly after the 1979 revolution in Islam, we, um, we kind of come away with the idea that, you know, from the late 1970s and certainly by the 1980s, um, Islam is also viewed by Washington, D.C. primarily as a potential threat to U.S. interests around the world. And I think the kind of hegemony of the Iranian experience and how we think about the relationship between Islam and U.S. foreign policy eclipses the fact that during much of the Cold War, the United States actually perceived considerable geopolitical utility in Islam. So, you know, many of you joining us today will be very familiar with the um, ongoing discussion about Saudi Arabia's export of Wahhabism, the, the very particular variant of Salafi Islam uh, indig indigenous to the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and the ways in which uh, it is potentially connected to various forms of instability and violence around the world. Um, in fact, during uh, much of the late period of the Cold War, the United States um, uh, absolutely welcomed Saudi Arabia's export of Wahhabism, particularly because it was viewed by Washington, D.C., as a useful counterbalance to uh, the atheistic orientation of Soviet communism. So particularly in countries perceived by the United States as being at risk of a communist ins insurrection, um, uh, Saudi and Gulf funding of religious causes in those countries was actually very welcomed. And so I think in some ways, early Russian attitudes towards Islam after the Cold War, um, you know, were could have carried a lot of that baggage um, with them. That said, it, it would be inaccurate to characterize the uh, Russian post-Cold War attitude towards Islam as one of exclusive enmity. Um, already by the 1990s, uh, there were opening certain kinds of channels of cultural and religious exchange uh, selectively with some countries. So for example, um, there was established with Iran um, a, uh, a, a sort of structure that enabled um, dialogue, uh, theological dialogue between the Russian Orthodox Church um, and theological uh, seminaries and religious structures in Iran. Um, part of, I think, um, uh, the idea uh, and linked to the idea that both countries found value in positing a shared challenge to the sort of idea of Western cultural he hegemony that, that Gulna has also referred to in, in her presentation. I think this can also be seen um, as kind of part of a broader Iranian effort at the time um, to kind of position itself as a um, sort of chief spokesperson of kind of a broad resistance uh, culture. Um, and so can be read and understood as part of kind of broader aspects of Iranian foreign policy that saw, um, for example, former Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, you know, linking up with figures like Hugo Chavez in v v Venezuela, um, Iran uh, becoming a key player in, for example, the, the World Social Forum, uh, making common cause with um, anti-globalization groups in Thailand and elsewhere. Um, and so part of a sort of broader early engagement uh, in uh, kind of counter-neo-imperial uh, and anti-hegemonic activism. 
As we get into the period of, uh, of Putin's leadership, however, we begin to see something of a pivot towards a broader sense of strategic utility vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia's Muslim populations as an asset that, that could be deployed by the Kremlin um, in order to help build and improve ties with the Middle East and Russia's own Muslim majority in its near abroad. And so that's when we, we begin to see developments such as, for example, um, Russia seeking and obtaining observer status at the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, um, obviously uh, an intergovernmental body strongly influenced by Saudi Arabia, that Russia-OIC relationship has not always been very easy and has experienced periods of kind of, kind of ups and downs um, over, for, for example, uh, Russia's role in, in, in Syria. But since the mid-2000s, there has been this consistent engagement um, by uh, consistent engagement of the OIC by Russia as a uh, space, an intergovernmental space and forum that allows uh, R Russia to pursue a kind of strategic and systematic Eurasian policy. Um, in 2006, we saw the establishment of a specific uh, forum, the Russia Islamic World Strategic Vision Group, as a, again, a sort of um, multilateral talk forum that allowed for uh, a sort of conduit of diplomatic, cultural, and eventually also business and commercial exchange uh, between Russia um, and a number of Muslim majority uh, countries in Eurasia and the Middle East as well. And of course, we would be remiss in not um, noting uh, that during this same period, uh, you had the emergence of Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, a figure that obviously Gulnaz mentioned is quite, you know, important uh, as a spokes figure for uh, Russia's Muslim populations more broadly. Ramzan Kadyrov also engage, emerges as the Kremlin's kind of preferred chief relationship broker with the broader Muslim world, particularly the UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia. That's not to say that Kadyrov's agenda and Putin's agendas were always perfectly aligned, um, but certainly in Kadyrov, Putin saw someone uh, who had accommodated himself to the political preeminence of Moscow and also was willing to respect certain kinds of red, red lines. And so there was a certain convergence of, of interest there. I, I think what's most fascinating in terms of the immediate question before us today, and also making sense of um, sort of current, current trends that we see, is the fact that Putin's articulation of a sort of Russian world discourse or narrative um, from 2013 is actually notably inclusive of Russian religious diversity. So, so yes, Christianity is a central reference point. Uh, for this idea of the Russian world, but this Russian world is also multi-confessional and also open, importantly, I think, to all those who share its values, understood as traditional conservative, quote unquote, family values, which obviously makes space for conservative Muslim populations in Russia, as well as providing a conduit for outreach to conservative Muslim populations beyond R Russia's borders. We also see Moscow um, becoming uh, a little bit more forward-leaning in terms of um, uh, inserting itself within discussions and debates internationally that involve um, uh, Islamic scholars. I think the 2016 Grozny Conference um, is a very important uh, moment here. It was a gathering of um, uh, senior international Islamic leaders from a variety of countries and from a variety of theological backgrounds um, to have a discussion with each other that sought to kind of set the boundaries around uh, who counts as an Orthodox Muslim. And this was a sort of very avowedly anti-Salafi 
um, uh, conference that was designed to affirm the centrality of the traditionalist current of Islam that is dominant within uh, Russia's own provinces, Muslim provinces, as well as the sort of a political orientation towards Islam um, that was being advocated at this point by uh, Middle East power brokers such as the UAE. More recently, um, I, I think it is precisely the fact that Moscow, Riyadh, and Abu Dhabi, and you could perhaps add to the list Beijing as well, um, all have a shared conception of uh, what they call moderate Islam that enables a certain level of geopolitical and national security alignment. Um, those of you who follow Saudi Arabia will have noted uh, the intriguing comments that Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman made a few weeks, a few years back, where he announced that he was going to return Saudi Arabia to moderate Islam. Now, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's public relations um, operatives in places like Washington, D.C., tried to spin this as evidence of the Crown Prince's commitment to religious pluralism and tolerance and the coexistence of different faith groups. I think, though, that the record, the, 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 the Mohammed bin Salman's track record thereafter and the ability of countries as diverse as Russia, China, and Saudi Arabia to make common cause around this framing of moderate Islam um, tells us something about what that moderate Islam discourse is really about. Um, and it's really about the idea that uh, religion and religious life for M Muslims, be they in Saudi Arabia, be they in China, or be they in Russia, uh, need to proceed in compliance with a, a, an officially state-approved understanding of, uh, of Islam and its place in society. Um, so in a sense, you know, this emphasis on moderate Islam um, is an effort to um, uh, move the Muslim populations of Russia uh, and other countries that are kind of part of that transnational moderate Islam coalition away from politicized understandings of religion associated with uh, groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, um, and obviously Saudi Arabia and the UAE have emerged in recent years as the leaders of a re regional axis uh, opposed to uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood in the Middle East. Finally, I think that, um, and this is again picking up on a point that, that Golaz began to make as, as, as well, um, we also see this idea of Russia announcing itself to the world as a country that is prepared to defend family, traditional family values, um, and using that as a reference point for building soft power solidarity uh, with conservative countries in the Middle East in the context of a changing world order. Um, I think what's interesting to note though is that there's nothing unique about Russian engagement um, of a sort of transnational uh, conservative family values and discourse. There are a number of, of countries um, that, that have incorporated aspects of this same discourse into their external relations. Uh, you see it in uh, Bolsonaro's Brazil. Um, you see it uh, in Erdogan's Turkey. Uh, you see it uh, as well in Modi's India. And there are various ways in which transnational conservative family values, civil society networks aligned with the Kremlin, um, aligned with uh, the RSS uh, Hindutva movement in, in India, um, and aligned with um, conservative state conservative exponents of official Islam as promulgated by state institutions in the Middle East 
are linking up and networking with each other um, as part of a broader front. Uh, with the Kremlin, I think, em em emerging as one of the kind of key br brokers um, within these networks. And I think it's this trend that I think will be particularly important to watch um, in the, 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 the coming years. So I think I will leave it at that and, and really looking forward to our discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. That's also very, very interesting and helpful. And I, I have a lot I would like to ask. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, field some questions myself here, but I will get to also Dr. Katie Kalaitis's question, which is very, very important. Um, she also does really important work on Islam and Orthodoxy. So I'll be sure to get to that, but I want to ask you guys to first uh, questions right now. So um, Gulnaz, could you tell us a little bit more about the reasons why the Russian state securitizes Islam um, starting early, starting in the 1990s, as opposed to post 9-11. And just for people who are watching, when we say securitization of Islam, we're referring to the phenomenon whereby states and governments that are a non-Muslim majority, usually Christian states, but also, of course, um, China and Myanmar, uh, come to see Islam and Muslims as a threat to their security, and then begin to use that state power to control or dominate Muslims in some way. Um, so could you tell us, because that's a very fascinating and important point, that Islam becomes securitized, an object of state, of state suspicion before 9-11. What, you know, what, what's the context, uh, this is the bar, also the broader context of just the ethnic minorities we're talking about themselves. They've been in Russia for centuries. Um, you know, what's their, what's their basic history? Who are they? And how did they become this, this target of state suspicion so early in the 90s? Thank you, Philip. And I would even say that this whole idea of securitization, though you probably wouldn't use the same term, started way before that in the history. Uh, yeah, since the incorporation of those Muslim point. communities starting in the 16th century, this you have indeed the, the, what is today Tatarstan and Bashkortostan, so central uh, Russia, and then com communities, Muslim communities in Siberia, and way later the Caucasus and Central Asia. And already from the very early age, and indeed if we stick to the 16th century, this whole idea of indeed incorporating those communities into first so what it was um, Russia and then the Russian Empire, uh, either on the level of religion, where religious identity and religious practice were indeed the defining features of belonging and whatever citizenship, if we can use those terms uh, to, to that period of time, though you do have, for example, instances of forceful um, baptism, where entire communities were forcefully baptized, and in order to indeed preach their allegiance uh, to, to the Russian state, you know, not to be persecuted or not to have to pay huge amount of taxes that were unproportionally divided across communities. And I would say even in the uh, 18th and more so in the 19th century, you do have this fear of pan-Islamism, pan-Turkism, where those, indeed, the possibility of unite, the communities uniting themselves and opposing the Russian state has become a security threat. Because what you have is that the leader of Muslim communities at that point is an Ottoman Empire. Um, so he is indeed considered to be um, the religious leader, whereas the political leader is indeed the Tsar or Tsarina at that point. And you do have the Muslim people in Russia having this divided identity on the one hand looking up to, to, to Istanbul and on the other hand having to follow uh, the rules of the Russian state. And of course the Russian state had ser serious ways and ideas how to make sure that the communities remain loyal to the Russian state in the case of, for example, this very often happening uh, Russian-Turkish wars. This continues also in the Soviet Union to similar extent, indeed what uh, Peter already mentioned, uh, this whole fear of uh, Mujahideen in the, uh, in the war in Afghanistan. Of course, this is again the whole idea of Islam being a threat and Islam being uh, um, this destabilizing factor. But what you have in the Soviet Union, this whole fear of religion is sometimes get mixed up with fear of uh, different ethnicities. So xenophobia and Islamophobia are quite often coinciding and it's sometimes very difficult to disentangle those two and to the same extent the same procedure continues also in the 90s because the the people from the Caucasus uh, they were also very much labor migrants because the Caucasus continues to be uh, the region with uh, severe economic difficulties and a lot of communities were traveling to for example to Siberia in order to be able to work there or to bigger cities in central Russia and this fear of a different person uh, because again maybe to draw parallels in Russian 
sometimes those communities from the Caucasus are called as blacks, literally. So they are very much marked simply by the way they look. And this xenophobia after the 90s and the wars in Chechnya just has been replaced by Islamophobia. Um, and the securitization issue has been more warped around the fear of Islam and particular doctrinal um, peculiarities of religion rather than a certain ethnic behavior or historical fears about the Caucasus not having been properly integrated and wanting always to to uh, to separate itself from Russia. So in that sense, it's simply a discursive warping uh, of indeed the same fear of the other uh, under different circumstances uh, rather than something new that just has emerged in the 90s. That's, that's also very interesting. So I want to just maybe um, throw out two analogies, and I want you to tell me if they're good or bad ones. Sure. So that might be interesting to at least have out in our <laughs> sure. mind. Um, and the first one is, to me, this sounds like, and again, tell me if I'm wrong or right about this, uh, the ethnic Muslim populations in the Russian Empire, to me, sound like simply the mirror image of Orthodox minority populations in the Ottoman Empire. They're treated, they have the same kind of problems, they have the same relationship with the state, the majority religion views them the same way. You even mentioned um, excessive taxation on them, mm -hmm. which again is the complete mirror image of the way minorities are handled in that state. I mean, it, it, to think about, can we, does it make sense in any way to think comparatively about the Russian minority under the Orthodox Tsar and the Orthodox minority under the Sunni Muslim um, Sultan? Of course, I mean, there are a lot of grounds for comparison, but at the same time, I think there are serious differences okay. simply by the way the Ottoman Empire was composed and how it grew and how these communities indeed came to represent. To, to my limited knowledge, to what extent I know is that um, indeed, I think there was a more or less realization of this coexistence of different uh, groups and different religious groups. So although indeed you do have a burden of taxation, but at the same time, those communities were given a bit more autonomy and more, yeah. uh, for mm -hmm. example, freedoms to practice their religion, to speak their languages, mm -hmm. which I think in case of um, Russia, this whole nation building, which started in, let's say, late uh, 18th century, 19th century, um, was in itself a difficult process because Russia had this um, blurred identity of not being entirely Europe, but also not being entirely Russia. So in itself was struggling with its own identity and that also reflected the way how it treated its own Muslim communities. So I think in that sense, the whole nation building in Russia and nation building in the Ottoman Empire are different. And which means that this whole processes that effects that had on minority communities were also slightly different. But you have to keep in mind also, if we speak about Muslim communities um, in both, um, that there is, has been a lot of contacts uh, between Muslim communities in Russia and the Ottoman Empire. And certain processes have started in the Russian Empire, for example, Quran translation, Quran printing, that came later to the Ottoman Empire. So in that sense, some even minority communities brought some innovations to majority communities, for example, in Ottoman Empire. So in that sense, it, again, um, 18th, 19th century, it's very close cooperation, connection in cultural levels between the Muslim communities across two empires. Wow, that's, that's, that's really fascinating. I appreciate that a great deal. Um, I want to ask Peter something very quickly and then, and then we'll move to um, uh, Dr. Kalias' question and come back around. So Peter, you talked um, a lot about the concept of strategic utility, which I think is very, very helpful. Like when you, when we're talking about, and you also, because I also want to break down a few concepts that could be helpful for us to think with, with the audience here. So you mentioned how um, in Russia state, the Russian state's pursuit of using religious identity for its own geopolitical benefit. You mentioned the Grozny conference um, that occurred recently. And you mentioned how at that location, at that place, Muslim traditionalism, as opposed to Salafism, becomes something the Russian state's interested in. So for those of you who are all watching, in Islamic studies, when we talk about Muslim traditionalism, what we mean is sort of the, the, um, the uh, continual, mainstream, everyday Sunni practice that involves allegiance to uh, ancient ritual, what your grandparents, your great-grandparents did, even things like folk religion, is that there's an old hierarchical structure, the ulama, the Muslim scholars, it's, a, it's not unlike what we call traditional forms of Christianity. Salafism, and Peter, you're the expert here, so tell me if I'm wrong on this, we can think of as a kind of neo-puritanical 
fund, quote unquote fundamentalist, but something that's actually quite non-traditional, opposed to these older forms of worship and practice that we that, that are associated with idolatry. So in a sense, puritanical in that way. Why is it the case? Does why is it the case that Muslim traditionalism, Sunni traditionalism, is useful to the Russian state, and the puritanical Salafism is not? Because that that's that's I think something interesting to think about. Yeah, absolutely, great question, um, and and happy to to respond on that. I, I did want to briefly just though kind of reinforce and double down on the point Please. that Bernaz made about the importance of understanding continuity between mm -hmm. contemporary and historical periods of Muslim securitization. Um, I was asked a few years back to review a proposal that a research funding body had received that was proposing to st study um, mechanisms of state regulation and control of Muslim populations by the Russian empire. And the section of the proposal where they were asked to comment on the contemporary relevance of this historical research, the answer they gave was that, you know, these, these examples from the Russian Empire may provide models that the governments in contemporary France, Germany, and the United Kingdom could potentially use vis-a-vis -vis their, their current Muslim populations. Oh, so wow. it's, it's, it's not just the idea that this has been going on for some time, the idea that, that some may see that that there there are sort of quote unquote best practices that can be somehow recovered from previous periods of Muslim securitization um, that are relevant for today. So, you know, one one of the dominant tropes in post 9-11 security discourse around Islam has been this I idea of uh, a sort of dichotomous um, concept of good Muslims and bad Muslims, right? Bad Muslims, roughly speaking, are groups that operate with an understanding of their religion um, in which is Islam is a political project that seeks to restructure every aspect of life as well as the state, um, you know, and ranging, you know, and ranges in its, uh, you know, methods from, you know, education to, you know, nonviolent political activism to the use of violence. And so that would contain in, in the, you know, the broad imagination groups um, anywhere on, on a spectrum from, you know, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood um, up to and including groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And then in the quote-unquote good Muslim category, what you most commonly find um, in, in the, again, the Western security imagination is this idea that, um, you know, what, what, what you've characterized or talked about as practices of folk Islam, you know, those most commonly associated with S Sufism, you know, this has been imagined as somehow a, an incredibly passive, quietist, Tolerant, tolerant, almost kind of soft, cuddly form of Islam that, you know, if only it could be empowered and funded, um, then, then the, the sort of voices of traditional Islam would somehow negate um, the quote unquote bad I I Islam. And so this, this, this idea of a sort of cosmic engagement or a spiritual engagement between uh, Sufism and S -S Salafism has been a kind of persistent trope here. Um, it, it was geopolitically useful, I think, for the, the sponsoring and host uh, countries of the 2016 Grozny Conference to kind of build the normative um, pillar of that event around traditional Islam um, because it helped to emphasize um, the idea a shared idea of a commitment to an Islam that is not, 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 you know, in the imagination of its organizers, not only not politically engaged with a Islamic identity, but one that is comfortable to uh, sort of, you know, sub, sub, you know, uh, you know, Muslim subservience to the state. Um, it it ignores, however. Um, the fact that, you know, traditionalist Islam has not always historically been as quietist as it's often imagined, including, you know, in, in Russian territories, um, in Southern Arabia, 
uh, in parts of the Sahel and West Africa, um, ver various rebel and insurrectionary movements from the 19th century onwards have been led by Sufi groups. So it's just not accurate to say that Sufism is politically quietist. Likewise, the dominant trend in Salafi Islam, even though again in the, in the kind of public imagination, we tend to associate Salafism with groups like Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS, and that's not incorrect in that you could call these groups Salafi Jihadi, but the main thrust of modern Salafism has actually been one of loyalty to the state. Um, so, you know, while not historically accurate, I think 2016 represented a moment that brought about the convergence of a set of political actors who were invested um, in, in a particular framing of Islam that they saw as conducive to their political interests at that moment. Thank you very much for that. Again, so much, I mean, so much we could say about this. I mean, what's, I, I think your point here is very, very helpful to remember that we, again, to, to echo what you've all already said, in Western discourse, typically try and find some Islam that is non-political and one that is political, as if that could be clearly identified. And if anything, because we, because in a comparative sense, we believe that there's a version of Christianity like that as well, that there must be some non-political, true Christianity and politicized non-true Christianity if anything, we've learned, or we should have learned a long time ago, that that's not the case for Christianity either. Um, so I appreciate that a great deal. So I want to get to Dr. Kalias's question. I mean, this brings us back to the main sort of point that really, and I want, maybe want to have the whole discussion of how, Gulnaz, how you were saying that um, the head of the Mufti, especially like Gaid Dean, the major Mufti in Russia, are directly copying the Russian world's moralist, traditionalist ideology um, in support of the same kind of state project. She writes, I would be interested to know if Dr. Sibgatulina thinks that the Muftiates have been able to leverage or benefit the global culture wars to facilitate their efforts to approximate themselves to the Russian Orthodox Church. It seems to me within Christianity, this language has been a tool for sidelining theological disagreement in the name of their political alliances. I'd be curious if it works the same way for interreligious relationships, particularly because of the inter-Christian alliances are built in part of hostility to Islam. Indeed, very, very good question. And I think the answer will have several parts. Um, I think important to note that this whole waging of the culture wars made it easier for many religious leaders in Russia to pick sides. Because in the 2000s and 2010s even, there was continuity between finding a balance that on the one hand still maintaining a relationship with Europe, but at the same time not uh, driving too far from the Russian state. And for example, you do have still in 2010s uh, the whole idea of Quranic humanism, where on the one hand there is an idea that Islam is very much compatible with human rights uh, discourses, so there's a bar towards the Europe, but at the same time it's very much in line uh, with the norms upheld in the Russian society. So with the culture wars, basically removing any gray space in between and knowing this black and white kind of dichotomies, it has become very easy just to side with the Russia that opposed itself to the West and again, very imagined um, entity and just drop all attempts to somehow find a more nuanced uh, position. So in that sense, yes, I think the whole discourse and Russia presenting itself as a very conservative player on the global scale, it made it easier for Mufti Aids to need to pick one uh, very clear uh, discourse. At the same time, unlike uh, Russian Orthodox Church that, for example, has been reaching out to Christian conservative movements, for example, in the US, or still working with communities, for example, in Serbia, Muslims do not have that possibility exactly because of this whole idea of securitization. Because on the one hand, you should be moderate, but not too European. And at the same time, you should be moderate, but not too conservative, because the conservative side fall immediately into what Peter was saying, this uh, bad Muslim or Salafi or fundamentalist. So any attempt to indeed, for example, to uh, look for affiliate associations, affiliations with more conservative uh, Muslim communities, either within Russia itself or with outside communities or countries, simply dangerous. Um, 
because indeed drawing alliances with Saudi Arabia, as Peter was indeed very um, uh, well in describing the whole tension, is simply not possible for Muslims who are operating on European uh, side or the uh, Siberian side, simply because of this whole fear of Muslim radicalization or the spread of fundamental ideas. So on that side, I would say that um, what Muftiates and the leaders of Muftiates do, they simply indeed just stay within the frameworks uh, defined by the Russian state and supported to some extent with the Russian Orthodox Church, but they do not have much possibility, opportunity to experiment with pushing this whole discourse further to, to, the, to the conservative side, to the far, uh, far right side, and indeed they mostly sort of operate within the boundaries that are already set by the Russian state and the Russian Orthodox Church. Again, that is such an interesting point, and I think that's also helpful to remember, just to go on what you're saying, to remember how those global um, reactionary far-right conservative alliances, moralist alliances, like you're saying, are already built on the existence of those alliances, those, those ideologies already having state power. I mean, they, they speak as if they don't, as if they're under threat, but they can only reach out internationally because they have state power to begin with, and their states let them do that. And as you're pointing out, if you don't have that kind of state power, if you're a minority, as in, as in uh, Russia, uh, ethnic uh, Muslims in Russia, like you're saying, as you point out, you can't do that because it's seen as threatening. It's very, very interesting. And again, it reminds me of um, Christian minorities in places like Turkey, when also the transnational connections are seen as highly suspicious, I inherently, whatever their, their value or, or, or status. Um, I have one last question that we'll, we'll do here in just a few minutes just to, to end our, end our uh, discussion. Question for um, uh, Dr. Subgatulina. Could you speak about the Ruski Mir, the relationship with the Ruski Mir ideology and its implied ethnic exclusivity as a shared worldview? Which, okay, so to, can you talk about the relationship between the Ruski Mir and the, and its, and the ideology and its relationship with, with ethnicity and how that works mm -hmm. in the, 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 the context of the ethnic minorities in Russia? Sure, because indeed, as, as I see in the question, there's a good distinction between Ruski, which is most of the time is understood as an ethnic uh, identity, and Rasiski as a citizenship belonging to Russia, uh, Russia as a country. But at the same time, what we've seen in the last 10, 15 years, that idea of Ruski has been very much expanded to include also other Slavic nations. So we do see this whole Ruski Mir umbrella ideas to include also Belarus and Ukraine, but also Ruski, again, in the state discourse, so we have to distinguish between the Russian Orthodox Church discourse, which is very much squarely focused on indeed the uh, Orthodox Christianity ideas and the rebuilding Rus as indeed the unity between Slavic Orthodox, conservative, Orthodox Christian Slavic uh, communities and the state project of Ruski Mir, which is broader, a uh, soft power instrument to also have influence over Russian diaspora communities abroad, well beyond the post-Soviet uh, space countries. Ruski in this sense becomes everyone who speaks Russian. So for um, indeed Muslim leaders in the beginning, of course, it was true, still very uh, dangerous path to how to fit in into Ruski Mir ideas without antagonizing Muslim communities which are very much based on minority identity and built in opposition to everything Ruski. But with Mufti, it's very much adopting Russian language as a language of Islam. This has become relatively easy. So I would say it was possible, though with certain limitation. Therefore, Eurasianism ideology has been more popular in this uh, project making rather than Ruski Mir. So Eurasianism was somehow built in into Ruski Mir ideas, so everything what indeed uh, Russia has power over. But I would say in the current situation, indeed with the situation in Ukraine worsening, we do see um, Muslim leaders standing very much behind the Kremlin and very much supporting uh, the current uh, invasion of Ukraine, which is again, not entirely representative for how communities, Muslim communities themselves experience the war and what they think about the war. So here we should indeed, again, draw um, distinctions between what is set on the official level and how Muslim leaders uh, represent Muslim communities on the major mainstream discourse and how communities themselves perceive the war because indeed, for example, was even Chechen 
groups, you do have fighting on both sides, both on the side of Ukraine and both on the side of Russia. So it's just as an example of that, it's not as clear cut and the whole support for Ruskimir among Muslim communities is way uh, not so unanimous and not so uh, clear, distinguishable. That's again, very helpful. And that's a really good lesson sort of to end on exactly as you're saying, how the distinction between leadership and uh, the populace under an authoritarian regime is a very, very, very different thing and hard to discern especially in a minority community like the ethnic Muslims who simply don't have even the power that the Russian Orthodox Church does. So I want to thank you both. We're right here at time, but I want to thank you both for your contributions. I think we talked about some important issues here that have not been uh, discussed yet. I appreciate it very much. And thank you all for coming and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks so thank much. You. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>